All right, it's 2 o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. My name is Justin Grody. I'm a data center solutions architect, Ally Digital. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I've been doing PowerShell for a while. Around, I think I started around like a little bit before Exchange 2007, but that's when I really kind of got into it. Bounce around here, there, everywhere. I use it in all facets of my work. My work is probably like 80% PowerShell these days, and that's because I made it that way. Like I've found places where I could apply it and just ended up finding more and more work to do those things. And so I've been able to do all kinds of nifty stuff. So today I'm going to be talking about Azure Functions and PowerShell. Uh, the miss I call this the missing manual because this is a bunch of stuff that you're not going to find. This is not a dig on the documentation. The Microsoft Docs guys are here, and I could tell they were slightly offended. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Mike. But um, I want to be clear, though, like the, especially recently, the docs for Azure PowerShell Functions have gotten great, like especially with the bindings. They have these automated generated things for how to do it in PowerShell where you used to have to kind of figure it out from the JavaScript reference. So that team's doing a great job on that. This is just more like a bunch of fringe stuff that you come up with from having worked with Azure PowerShell for a while. Some tips and tricks, neat things to do there. So that being said, we are going into the weeds today. We are going to do all kinds of crazy stuff. And this is not an intro class. So like, if you have never heard of functions or anything like that, um, these are some great places to get started. You know, if you want to stay and check this out, like I'm going to show all kinds of nifty stuff that you can do within the context of Azure Functions. But if you don't have any um, major background in it, then like, there's two other fantastic presentations going on right now. And if you want to slip out the back and hit one of those, I will not fault you at all. Um, so, but we're just going to go into like some more advanced stuff about Azure Functions, some kind of tricky stuff that you may or may not be able to use. Um, but this is not an intro class. I'm just going to get that out of the way right now because I've been in places where like I wish somebody would have told me that right up front because I'm like, uh, I don't know what's going on here. That being said, this is also an open question uh, uh, presentation. So just raise your hand and I'm happy to go through it. I got tons of content here. I plan to have it till we run out of time. So I'm either going to do content or I'm going to do questions. Works either way. And if you don't know anything about Azure Functions and I'm doing something, you're like, what is that for? What do I do it for? I'm happy to answer those questions too. So uh, feel free there. So again, we're going to the weeds, but don't be scared. So um, just a little bit about my company because they're so gracious to uh, pay for my travel here. Uh, Ally Digital is a multinational company. Uh, been around quite a while. I've been with them in one form or another for about uh, since 2006. And uh, um, really enjoyed working with them. We work uh, across all different areas. Uh, most of our functions are in service delivery, MSP. We, you know, we take over IT infrastructures, run them for people, provide large amounts of consulting and such like that. And so, um, yeah, really good company, diverse, lots of different aspects, service desk, et cetera. You know, if you're looking for a partner, technology partner, that kind of stuff, you can do a lot worse than Ally Digital. And uh, I'm really happy to work with them. And again, thanks very much for having them have me here. So we're going to go through a few things. Um, I'm going to start with here because I want to start with, because we're going into like the missing manu uh, manual, it's always a good idea, I think, to start where you are at the beginning. I don't know if since I can't step in front of the screen, let me see if I can, is there a laser thing on this thing? I don't know. I'm not even going to risk it. I'll just point. So uh, the, um, this is basically what the Azure Function stack looks like. So if you've, you know, with Azure Functions, what it is, is effectively, and all of Azure Functions in general, not just PowerShell, is it's this way to have a serverless architecture, microservices, whatever those terms mean to you. It's a way to be able to compartmentalize and run small pieces of PowerShell code or you know, small, small entry points into a larger PowerShell system and be able to have those in such a way that they're modular, that they're scalable, and that you don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure. You just define your inputs and outputs. You define what your flows look like. And whether it's one request or a million requests, you generally don't have to worry about it. The system just scales up and scales down to accommodate that. The way that it does that is that it's all built on Azure App Service. Like, it is not its own separate, like, cool whiz band thing. The whole thing is built on top of Azure App Service, and that's down here at the bottom. So a lot of, if, if you've used Azure App Service, if you've done any kind of IIS stuff, played around with it, kicked the tires, a lot of the stuff in Functions, it, once you get under the hood of the very top level of it, it's going to look really familiar. Stuff like deployment slots, stuff like zip deploy, stuff like how the, the uh, plans work. Um, all of that is, it's all that same architecture underneath, just in the same way like Microsoft Flow or what is it called now, Power Automate is all logic apps underneath. You know, it's like, this is just everything that gets done these days is just standing on the shoulders of giants. And I really want to emphasize that because, you know, you see a lot of stuff that's like, oh, it's this cool whiz bang new thing. But like, you know, when you have something that's good and it works, like you have this great model. 
So the app service has a thing called web jobs, which are basically, they were a way in IS to kind of, in, in app service, to kind of trigger executions. They said, well, what if we built a bunch of extra stuff on there and made a host that could translate to that web jobs architecture? Because it was really good at scaling out and handling these things. And what if we had a scale controller that could you know, go out to 150, 300, 500 server instances and then bring it back down? And so that's what they made. And they made this web jobs rub tie with the Azure Functions host. And then on top of that, um, the C Sharp um, initially runs inside that same area. But there's a new one that just came out that's also the C Sharp isolated one. The reason I bring up C Sharp, even though we're talking in PowerShell here, is that the, the layers is basically, there's a new layer that's been kind of inserted here. So where that language runtime, there's an additional little layer that's called the worker. And that worker layer is where the PowerShell part sits. So it all communicates with the underlying thing with a protocol called gRPC, which you're not going to have to worry about or know about um, with this, except for one um, error demo I'm going to show off. But the big thing is that um, that worker runtime is there. And you can write your own worker runtime. And the whole PowerShell worker runtime is out on GitHub. So if you ever want to know how Azure Functions works, you can see literally how it works. You can see every, although you have to learn how to read C Sharp a little bit, but you can kind of figure it out. I'm not the greatest C Sharp guy in the world, but you can go in there and see like, oh, this is how it, like when, when I call a function, like how it figures it out and how it runs in. Oh, this is how it takes my warning output and converts it into what Azure Functions does. So there's a, whole, there's a whole thing in there, and that's how that works. And it's not just for PowerShell. They have one for Node.js. They have one for F-sharp, PHP, Python. There's all these different workers that all sort of talk through this kind of common abstraction layer that allows all this other scale controller stuff to work. So the decisions that were made when this stuff was built were about how are we going to make it work, how do these scripts run, that kind of thing. And that's you know, what we're going to go into a bit of today and uh, look at maybe some better ways we can do things and some new tricks. And one thing that is very new, a very nice new feature that I'm looking forward to showing again. So yeah, let's just get to the demos because I'm not big on slides. So we are going to bring up trusty VS Code. Um, last I checked, I know it's dark, uh, dark mode. I'm a dark mode guy. Can you guys see that okay? Okay. This is going to be a little, we'll have to do a little shifting because this, like, to blow it up and make it look right, I'll have to get my uh, side stuff way out. I should, what I should have done is I should have changed just, just my editor to be a higher text, but we'll make this work. So um, here's kind of a thing of an, of an Azure function. I'm going to zoom this out for just a second to kind of give a higher lay of the land. I know it's going to be basically unreadable over here. But basically what we're looking at is this is sort of like a typical Azure function, the way it looks. And so we have a host JSON, which defines all our information. We have a thing with some secrets. And then we have all of our different functions defined here. So an individual function, for instance, a real standard function is just this sort of um, push output binding demo. as a function JSON that defines its properties. And then it has a run, which is your actual script. So what I'm going to show here is that one thing that's really common with um, these is this thing called push output binding. If you've seen push output binding, you know when you do it with, um, when you do it with Azure PowerShell, uh, it's kind of a tough thing to work with. Like it, it, you, you have to use the special .NET HTTP request context object, then you have to do a hash table and then the HTTP request status, and you gotta go through all that kind of stuff. And like, it's a really unwieldy thing to work with. It's kind of hard to troubleshoot, those kind of things. So I decided to make something. I was like, you know what? This is all, can all, again, we have PowerShell. We can make things. So I just made a tool called push HTTP binding, which makes this a little bit simpler. So th what this function does is you just simply have your, um, you know, your, your request that comes in, uh, mentions it, pulls some information out of the request, which is get the name off the query, uh, to, you know, sends a body here. If there's a name, change the output so that it doesn't match that. So we get a different output if somebody didn't specify something versus if they did specify something, and then push it out. So if you start an Azure function and you click demo, this is like the example it gives you. So if you've ever done Azure functions before and you've ever used the VS Code tool or done like a func new, you've seen this before. Is there, who here has seen like this sort of code before if they've done Azure functions? Yeah. Yeah, it should be pretty common. Like, this is sort of like the boilerplate example they give you. And I just did it here so it's familiar. But you know down here, like, it's like push output binding, and it's got like those brackets and HTTP. So I just made a new function called push HTTP binding, which takes that stuff and brings it all together in a much nicer way. So why does my mouse want to die on me? There we go. So one of the nice things here is I have this function, which is defined in a little separate module here under modules. This is a little sim link to where it's at. And it's, I think, under here on public. We'll go to push HTTP binding. So it's a lot of code, a bunch of stuff. But it basically what it's doing is doing a bunch of extra type detection for you so you don't have to. It just figures out what you're doing. And then finally it ends up 
this should look pretty familiar. Like this, basically, in the end, it ends up in this same block. But it does a lot of the extra work here. Where it's like, you know, you're a student in this, you got an HP request context. I do this a little bit differently than the example does it, but you know, it kind of comes into that aspect. And so if we go back to our actual function here, da, da, da. my back is going to kill me at the end of this. They didn't size this for me. Um, one of the things is because we use certain parameters, like for the status code, you can hit control space and you get IntelliSense in VS Code. So all the different kinds of HTTP statuses that you can do are right here, whereas before you have to kind of guess. And then as far as the headers, basically all of this now has autocomplete, whereas the push output binding, as you know if you've ever used it, like has no IntelliSense. So like you, if you've never done it before, you're working off examples, you have to run it to know if it's going to work or not. But here we have all our things. You can specify your content type, you can specify your response, et cetera. And so hopefully I didn't break my code enough. But yeah, see, this is, what, this is why we have source controls, because we can just kick it right back as it was. So we take that, we have that, and then I have a little extra headers thing. So I'm going to throw a little extra header on mine, which is, uh, this is a tribute to uh, a certain conversation that occurred last night that I decided to throw up here. And so we'll go ahead and get our function started. So uh, one thing you can make here in your VS Code is a task JSON. And just very simple, like this is one of the ones that it'll give you when you start, and I just kind of kept the default one for here for simplicity. You just do func, and it just, basically what this command simply does is it's just the same as going here and typing func start, which is starting the thing up. But it runs it in the background and lets you do some extra fun stuff, which we'll show here in a second. So for now, I'm just gonna do a control shift P, I'm gonna do run task, and then over here, it's gonna be func host start. And now my uh, functions is coming right up. Bring my console back over here, and then kill it because I'm an idiot. There we go. And that's not going to start up, and I know exactly why it's not, is because I did not start my Azure right in the background. So one thing that you may not know about with making um, Azure functions is like if you're doing functions, you usually need some kind of queue storage or table storage and that kind of stuff. And like all the examples generally point you to like building one out in Azure and using it out there. Well, that's not really that great for local development because you have to have network connectivity. You know, you can't test on a plane. So there's this extension that people have worked on called Azure Right. There's, they used to point you to using the Azure Storage Emulator, which was a Microsoft thing that ran like a SQL Compact Edition. It's ugly. It's not fun to work, and it doesn't work on anything but Windows. But there's this new thing they made called Azure Right, which is basically all written in Node.js. And so there's an extension for it for VS Code. You can also get it separately as like a, a, a global tool or anything like that. But basically, this thing emulates the same Azure Storage API, but you can run it locally. So that all that queue storage stuff and queue testing and writing to tables and reading from tables and blob storage, you can do it all locally. You don't have to. So anything, everything I'm going to do here is all going to be local. And so I just actually have to start the service up here. It's going to get going. There's my blob service. There's my queue service. Get all those guys going. And let's go ahead and start my thing back up again. Although my screen's all small again, it's gonna make sure it gets them all because they, they get hidden down here. There we go. All right, so those are all running. And we will go ahead and try to start our environment again. Okay, so now we're up. We have all our different functions and we have that push, that push binding demo which I'm just gonna go ahead and Copy the link here, put into my demo window that was supposed to be up, but it's missing. Come on back, you. And so there's that request, triggered success, oh man, I'm sorry. So there's that request, it went, it did that little text, had everything go, we can probably get rid of this. And if we do it with a little extra parameter, hello test. So there you go. So like, there's the simple example. But the nice thing here is that it's just much easier to work with. Like, that's a much simpler way to define it. And then the little extra thing which I had there, if we do our F12, yes, I know. I know what I'm doing. This is just a way to sort of trace what's going on. If you do that request again and you look at it over here, you can see in the headers, if I, can, I know that's going to be really tiny, there's my special header that I added. So re really simple way to do like the push output binding but with HTTP and um, I, I have a couple other versions of these like that 
aren't as useful because the, the like inputs, outputs for things are pretty straightforward. But you can do this with any kind of push out, input, output binding. You, know, you can define your own classes for that stuff to come in and out and then get better IntelliSense on it for, for working with it so that you actually have it. So uh, let's see, speaking of the IntelliSense, let's move on to uh, the next item that I have here, which is with the testing. So I have a function here. I'm gonna zoom back out a little bit, close this thing. Where did you go? You hit it right there. Okay, so again, so the HTTP output binding. So here's a pester test. Uh, this should look, uh, if you haven't ever done pester, who here has ever done a pester test before? Okay, great, good, good percentage. So this shouldn't be too strange. Um, you know, this first part is just, don't forget the, it's just boilerplate that basically just checks. If I was running my test earlier, it would have told me, you know, hey, your, your function isn't started. You know, go and run the task, stupid. Um, and then just a little extra little thing. Again, if you, if you get errors, I was gonna hide this guy here. One of the nice things that you'll see in my optimizing VS Code is there's this nice little extension called error lens that'll take all those problems you have down there at the bottom and bring it right up directly into the context of what you're doing. Super nice. So that if you're ever, like, you know, when you're writing code, like, immediately you get the message in the context of where it's happening. Uh, this is called error lens. And it's, uh, yeah, it's part of the PowerShell extension pack, which I made. I'll go and bring it up here. So this guy, error lens. And so by, by default, it's very bold. And so I have an example that kind of tone, like you see these colors are like, they're very, they're very like in your face. And so I have a version that like customizes the colors to kind of make them so they're like, they're not quite so in your face, you know. And then, uh, so basically we're just putting a suppression on here. Let, because it's just, it's how pester scopes work is this base URI gets defined in a separate scope, but then pester rehydrates it but technically the script analyzer can't figure that out, so it still thinks like, hey, you're not using this, even though you can see later down I actually am. So this is just a thing of seeing like, you know, pester scope can be weird, I know what I'm doing. If you, if you do put in suppressions in your code, it's always good to stick that little justification there so that people know why you, why you suppress that thing. And so I have my three tests here. You know, I have a test that's just simply, this is like an example of testing code, you know, sort of end to end, is rather than test, you know, the function itself, I can actually test against my Azure function, which is running in that local tools, and make sure that the inputs and the outputs work as I expect. So I have my input, I'm gonna to go to that push binding demo and just make sure that it reports that same code. So to do that, I'm gonna pop up this little guy. Who's ever seen this sidebar before? Yeah, see, this is new in VS Code. If you're not aware, this is an awesome new feature. It just came out, I think, a release or two ago, but you now can actually have a second sidebar in addition to your one. Like, I have mine on the right, most people have it on the left. So this will actually pop up on the right for you if, you, if all your uh, stuff is on the left. Um, but this is basically, less, and you can put anything here. So I put my breakpoints, my outline, and I put here, this is my pester test extension. I wrote an extension to run pester tests. And so it automatically discovers uh, my tests here. So here's my binding. And so we got works with no parameter, works with a query string, and works with a JSON body. So you know we can go ahead and test our little, test these guys here and make sure my thing is actually running. Okay, but it's running, so we can go ahead and start running these tests. And it'll probably break, but we'll see how it goes. Do, 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 come on. Let's try an individual one directly. I see now I broke my code, didn't I? And here we go with the, with the live fixing. So see, it, it, my test is failing here, saying, hey, I can't find an overload for the constructor. That's probably for my suppressed metrics attribute. I probably screwed something up in there, so we'll just take that off for now. And now it seems like it's a little bit happier. There it goes, going down, did that, and say, okay, great, that test passed. Do another one. That test passed too, sorry, that's tiny again, sorry. And we'll do it one more time there. So there's a really easy way to sort of do pester tests with your Azure functions, but testing them against that. And again, because everything runs locally, including the storage with Azureite, it makes it really easy to reduce your, your development loop. And there's a setting down here, I have it paused, but you can set it to auto run the tests on save. So every time you make a change, it can run your tests and see if they, if they still work. So for instance, I can take this test and like, if I end up screwing up this test, I'll minimize that real quick. So if I take this guy and I mess him up, I can save, and immediately run it again and see that it failed this time and that it should have been this, but it was that. And if I go to the individual test, it'll have all that detail for me too right there with it. So that's really handy. And so we'll go ahead and fix that back. One area, um, 
April was doing, uh, if you guys were here for the, uh, one of the main presentations, he was talking a bit about GitHub Copilot. Um, here's an area, and, and testing, so like here's an area where GitHub Copilot can really help you. I don't know how good my internet is in here, but we'll see if it works. But let's try, let's try it here. You know, works if the name is PowerShell Summit. We'll see if I get a Copilot response in here. Looks like it's coming in. Try starting it over. Oh, so somewhere I left a parentheses off apparently. There it is. I had it for a second. Come, come back to me. There you go. Okay. Oh, it, it wants to mess with me today. Look at this. There we go. So as you can see, Copilot fetched that. And so it took my previous tests and figured out that I wanted to actually have a test. So it went ahead and updated this, made this PowerShell summit, you know, and then updated my result to match that. So I'll do a tab, save that. Now I have my new test here, run that test. And that'll one probably suck. Now that test works. So that's an example of Copilot being like really clever, like, like scarily clever sometimes about like being able to figure out what you've written and then like take a guess just by doing what, having, you know, that was a comment-like thing where I did the test title, but you can do this in normal PowerShell code where you just write a comment and you say, I want a function that does whatever. And like, it'll get it pretty close most of the time because it's, it's working off this large base of all this PowerShell code that's already out on GitHub and this crazy AI analytic that ran against it. So really nice way to kind of get those additional tests in there. All right, we are doing good. So. So one thing about this testing is that, um, you know, this is all really nice, but, you know, if there's an error and you, you want to find out where the error is, like one of the things we really like in PowerShell is having debugging. So I'm happy to say that after three years, as of last week, uh, Patrick finally fixed a bug that now allows debugging to work in Azure Functions again. So I'm going to show that right now. So uh, again, I have my tests here, and I'm going to bring up my thing here. I have my integrated console, and I have my functions host, which I'm just going to go ahead and stop it for now, just so that it uh, starts from scratch. I'm going to go ahead and restart my uh, integrated console session. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to run, and I have a special run in here in my launch JSON. And in here, uh, excuse me, in my uh, tasks, no, yeah, my launch, I'm sorry. So the, the task JSON has that func host start, which I talked about, which starts it. This has a pre-task, and it does this thing for attach. So this is how it's always been. This is how the code always looked like three years ago, but then they changed something and it broke, and it's just, it's, it's a, it was a really pernicious bug to fix. But now that it's finally fixed, all I have to do is take my attach to Azure functions and run this, and what it'll do is it'll start up that func host again at the, at the beginning, get it all fired up, and then it's gonna go into debug mode here in a second. And so now we're in debugging mode in, in our PSIC, which, and it's, what it's done is that it's actually connected to that funkhost.net process, and now it can watch for anything that you do in Azure Functions. So if I use my, typically you could, you could run, I could go to the URL, but because I have Pester, why not use my Pester tester? So in this case, I want to do my test output binding. I'm going to go ahead and run this test. And you can see my debugger hopped right into where I had that breakpoint for this test. And you can see the name is null because I chose the one that works with no parameters. And you have all your details, your trigger metadata, your uh, everything about this function, all the detail about your request, you know, all the parameters, the function name, the invocation ID, all the fancy stuff. I guess the watch can go out of the way, but I could add that too. So you can now step through your PowerShell functions locally as you debug them to make sure that they work as opposed to the, you know, the try it and fix it, try it and fix it. I don't know where this is get, getting stuck. I don't know what this very is. You know, I'm gonna put a write host here so that it shows up in the console so I can see what the value of that is. You can go through here and just step every step of the way. And if you notice, by the way, in my, um, in mine, like next to each place statement where a variable exists, you see on the right there, it shows like what the value is at that time. This is an extension called inline values, which I'll talk about um, in the, uh, in the, uh, the Wednesday session. Uh, Tyler wrote this, the former maintainer of the uh, PowerShell extension. Works great. 
We're thinking of maybe having something like this into the official PowerShell extension. But it's just kind of just, again, when, you know, when they talk about in the presentation this morning how like PowerShell is like from the community now, it's like a tool of the community. This is a great example of this. This is just some Tyler wrote in his spare time. There's an API for it. VS Code had an API for it. He just tied that into the existing PowerShell stuff to read the information and then just published as an extension. My pester test extension like did not require any special functionality in the PowerShell extension. I just wrote it and had it read some information, do a little special thing that runs pester and reports the information back. But it's just another VS Code plugin like anything else. So, you know, I didn't have to get anybody's permission. I didn't have to get a Microsoft project manager to bless it. I just put it out there. And so that's one of the really great things about like this new Microsoft aspect and the new leadership. You know, when, when they talk about approaching this DevOps mindset and this open culture, I mean, they, they, they've been putting their money where their mouth is. And this is an excellent example of, what, of that. So that debugging is incredibly helpful. You can, again, you can just keep stepping through. You get to this point. You can verify that your body is what you want it to be and then complete it, and then it's done, and then it shows up on the other side. And this, this works just fine if you're doing it, just testing with the normal URLs too. So if I go to my runner here, I could probably hide all this stuff. Hide all this stuff. But go to my runner, I got my little special URLs down here. Well, I'm missing a couple. It's probably because I started a certain way. And so anytime you run, you, know, you run your different triggers, you know, it can just hop, you can test it either through the HTTP, you can do like the admin binding to get into it, or you can go into sort of the more detailed contextual aspect of it. And then you know, no matter what, you can still step through that function. Now you can't do this with like remote function, functions that are like live in production, but it should theoretically be possible, especially with some stuff that's coming in 7.3 that changes how some of the remote remoting subsystem works. They're, decoupling some stuff that allows us to make third-party plug-in transports for how PowerShell remoting works, that th it should be theoretically possible to make it so that you can debug a live in production PowerShell Azure function and bring it back and work on it and see you know, where it's at live. So that is the demo for that uh, testing and entry point. Um, any questions so far on any of this stuff or just anything in general on those items? Again, like I said, I'm going way in the weeds here. This is just fringe stuff that I just thought would be fun. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so that's actually the PowerShell extension. So the debugging is all built into Visual Studio Code. I'll, I'll show the extensions that you need to work with for here. So, yeah. Yeah, so in this case, this is just, this is a built-in functionality of the, of the PowerShell preview extension. And so what happens is that it's sort of a cooperation between the two. So there's the PowerShell preview extension, and then there's the Azure function extension. So this is the extension that over here on my Azure I have this nice view of all those functions that I have defined. I, I, was, I was browsing them in the code, but you can see them here too. And so basically the way that this works is that um, the, the PowerShell functions local tools that you have start the exact same worker that runs in the production cloud, like it's the exact same code. So what it, all of that is just simply, it's just a .NET application. And so .NET applications have a thing where they can have debuggers attached to them through a named pipe. So all that this does is that this makes it so that when that account is running, it, it attaches to that process, that func.exe process, and it watches for the PowerShell code to be invoked, because the PowerShell code, when it starts, there's a little special place where it creates its own named pipe. And then the extension just ties into it as if it was any other like remote session. And so it just debugs it as if you were debugging code locally on your computer. So that makes it really nice. So yeah, when you get into a function, you're it's just as if you're debugging it locally. And this stuff works through run spaces and, and like code spaces and SSH remoting. I've tested it lots of different ways. It works great. Um, you know, it's probably got a few bugs. Like there's a couple bugs right now where like if you detach the session before without like running it through and then closing the function host, you'll get like a detach error right now. But again, it literally just started working again last week. So <laughs> it's only in the preview extension. It's great. And if you do Azure Functions, like being able to debug Azure Function again is wonderful without having to do a bunch of crazy stuff like I used to have to do to make it work. Okay, so let's move on to a next thing. So one thing, um, if you work with uh, Azure Functions a lot, um, how many people have ever uh, looked at the logs and in application insights for Azure Functions? Okay, great. It used to be like everybody would just do it locally. They'd see the text, and they never knew about this wonderful, huge uh, environment of debugging logs called application insights. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up an item of that now. If I can get out of my Azure Function. Go ahead and kill that. Go away. That was not the one that I want. This really wants to mess with me today. 
So I'm just going to bring up a little App Insights demo here. Oh man, you're really going to make me do this just because I changed Wi Fi? It's so rude. Yeah, this guy. Yeah, it's not, it's not like I've gone anywhere. It's the same computer. It's got the same token on it. I do. My company really likes very restrictive MFA reauth policies. So, come on, I know you're there. Send it again. I should be on the. I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm on the Wi-Fi. I got it here. Worst case, I'll do just a, a token. I knew I should have done this ahead of time. I, think I, I, was, I thought literally if I was on the same SSID when I did it over there, it'd be fine, but apparently not, so. What's funny is like this one, it's like so far down on my list because I never have to do the one-time codes. Let's see if I get lucky. All right, it's my lucky day. All right, so we'll go to a section here. So if, if you've never seen this before, like you, know, you have all kinds of neat stuff, like an application map, you've got these live metrics that can show you in real time, like when your function's running both in production um, yeah, give it a second. It's there, it's just it's super tiny. Come on. Demo in the demo, yep. Sometimes this takes a second. Oh, it's because I don't have a thing actually connected, so, um, which we'll get to here in a second. So, uh, one thing with these, um, oh, come on, let's let them go away. So, one thing with um, application insights is you, know, you have all this data, you have your transactions and such like that, but typically it's running against your live production environment. But one thing that you can do is you can actually wire up application insights to your local environment. All you have to do, if you go into the code, you realize, oh, it's just, there's just this one key you have to supply at the instrumentation key for your app insights. So if you just take the code, you can use your same production one if you want to mirror the production in the local, or you can make a separate app insights workspace just for your local dev stuff. But you just have to simply fill it into your local settings. And so there's mine. Everybody take a photo for posterity because it's going to rotate after this meeting. So if you want to post it, it's a free account. Like, you know, post all kinds of nasty messages there. Anybody, anybody, anybody who can get in there real quick and post a message while I'm demoing it, I'm going to be pretty impressed. So get to work, Iron Scripters. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and so we just supply the key here. And then our next step is when we have any, anything that occurs now in our Azure function here. So for instance, I'm going to do this uh, simple example of an error. Actually, that's not my simple example. That's my complicated example. Where's my simple example? Normal terminating error demo. So this, this is a pretty simple script here. Basically, what this does is just picks a number between 1 and 3 and then throws one of three different kinds of errors, You know, just, just as an example. One of which is when the method's not right, one of which is trying to resolve a path that doesn't exist, another one is just a standard throw command. So we're going to take this uh, URL. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and kill this and restart it since my function was not running. Oh, actually, I don't want to do that in irrigate console. Let's do a fresh one. Get my little local version going here. And this is the great thing about the local development is that you can change things, save changes. It automatically recognizes them and reloads it for you, as opposed to having to publish out to Azure Functions every time and try to figure out what went wrong. Like, you know, this shortens your dev loop like super tight so that you can make sure that your functions and such work as you expect. So I got my normal terminating error demo here. Go ahead and uh, that should go into my demo link. So that's going to, oh, that's the durable. Yeah, it's doing a durable run. That's fine. Thankfully, it's Azure Functions. It scales. I can do the other one while that's running. Not a big deal. All right, so there we go. I got an error 500. Sorry, that's really tiny, I know. But basically, it's just, you know, I'm just getting an error on this page. Blow it up here. I'm going to hit that a few times. And so my live metrics, now you can see those incoming requests, and you can see those exceptions coming in on the right. And so I'm getting the different exceptions for the different kind of things that are happening. You know, I have a normal terminating error. You know, I have the invocation exception where the method wasn't correct. And so you can see all those, all those exceptions that every time I ran it, you know, they just kind of came in in real time so I can analyze them. So one thing that's kind of annoying about this, however, is if you go to the failures pane, everything comes in as an RPC exception. So like there's no breakout of the types. So like everything, you know, every single event that's happened, I should probably narrow this down to like the last 30 minutes. You know, all those errors that come in hasn't processed them down, but they all just come in as RPC exceptions. This is just due to a limitation in how the function worker works today. They're working on fixing it. I think it's going to be in the next sprint. But um, this was always a super big annoyance to me because I have applications that you know can generate you know thousands of errors. You know, and I generate errors in terms of like I use the error as a non-terminating error to be like this is something that somebody supplied the information wrong. Like everything else worked fine, but I don't want to crash everything out. 
But I can use those errors because they contain all the extra context that I need to then go back and contact those people and say, hey, fix your code. You're not submitting it to my Azure function correctly. But they all just show up as RPC exception. I can't break it out and I can't do a report of like, okay, you know, it's this many that did this issue and this many that did this issue and this many that did this issue. I can do that if I go into like the more detailed like log analytics and you do those cool custo uh, um, queries. But like I can't just get a good like at a glance view of it. So if you dig into the Azure Functions host, you realize that they just use the same applications insight library that everything does. And if you go into PowerShell itself, let's see, I think mine's on program files. I can't remember. I put stuff everywhere all the time, so. I got mine in C program files, I think, is where my PowerShell is, if I'm lucky. It is. So if I go in here, I go to 7 preview or 7. Uh, we got all these DLLs. Da -da 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 -da. Let's see, oh, wait a minute. What is, is there one called application? Uh, oh, look at this. Built into PowerShell is the application insights library. Remember in the presentation, they were talking about all the telemetry and they showed, like, you know, all that? It's because they use application insights. And so they have the application insights library built into PowerShell. Well, that means, wait, that library is there. That means I can use it to do my own stuff with application insights. So if you go to the .NET documentation for application insights, you kind of learn how to make one. And so I made this little function called, uh, where is he? I'm going to go into my little helpers under my modules. And here under public, I got this little function here. So here's the push out like I showed there. I have a function here that is write AI exception. And it's not a complicated function. I mean, this is all .NET stuff, but it, you know, it doesn't have to be that complicated function. Um, if you're just looking at this, you can probably kind of tell what it does. Let me blow it up here a little bit. So in this example, you know, in this case, I have a function, write AI exception, takes an exception as an argument. And so the first thing I do is I start up a, a telemetry client, which is part of Application Insights. And if you're not familiar with the syntax, this is just like a .NET shorthand to like call a constructor. And so now I have this object. And I have, because this is all the nice thing about, because this is part of PowerShell, like it shows up in the assemblies, I can do, I get IntelliSense for all this stuff, so I can see all my methods and what they do and all that good stuff. So you can, you can already in here just sort of explore what this command does, even without the documentation. What I do is I set an instrumentation key and I set it to that environment variable that comes from that little local settings JSON I showed earlier. And then all I got to do is TC track exception, which basically says, hey, take this exception, because it's just a .NET exception like anything else, and start, you know, hey, submit that. And then flush, it'll queue them up so that it submits them in batches. I want it to, excuse me, I want to send it ASAP, so that's why I do that flush command. That flush command just says, hey, don't, don't queue these up and send them in batches to be efficient. I want you to send them as fast as you get them. So now if I have that, that function there, I don't want to save the changes, whatever I did. I hope that doesn't break something. We'll find out. Um, I can have a different way of submitting these functions. So if I go to my, wherever it ran off on me, I really hate the way this structure works, and I have a thing for that too, but I don't know if we'll get to it. Uh, my App Insights error demo. So here, in this case, um, I have a trap at the beginning of my function. So now I can say, like, hey, if anything goes wrong in this function that like, I don't handle otherwise, that's a terminating error, that's what trap does, if you're not familiar with it. Basically, it just says, it's like a try-catch, but like a try-catch for your entire document. It's like, hey, if anything goes wrong, what I want you to do is write a warning, you know, and show, show me this warning at the console, and then use my special write AI exception to write, because what this will do is it extracts that exception and sends it directly to Application Insights, rather than going through the PowerShell host module, where it ends up having that RPC exception problem. By submitting it directly, it's going to have all of the context information, including the type, and it's not going to be wrapped in that RPC exception. So I'm going to get the actual error this time and be able to see it in the application insights as it is. And then I'm going to, and, you know, and now that I've done that, go ahead and throw it anyways, because as of today, if I just wrap this and go, the function is actually going to complete successfully, even though I want it to fail. And as of today, you can't do like an exit one or something like that. Like the only way that the host recognizes that a function has failed is if a terminating error happens. So something I've submitted to get fixed, hopefully it'll get fixed. But for now, you end up kind of with some duplicates here, but it's still good enough to get you where you need to go. So I have that, and so now I have my other function, which is my, uh, my app insights error demo. So we'll take that guy. We will run him a few times. Make sure he has an O on him. So again, error 500, error 500 for the person who's getting this because this didn't complete correctly how it should. Go way down here. And you'll see these are going. There's the errors happening. There should be a warning. There's that warning. Hey, I caught that exception. I'm going to send it to Application Insights before it fails. 
and we are good. So if we go back to Application Insights, we should see again that live metric, there's those uh, new exceptions coming in. And if we refresh this guy, this may take a little while. But over here in the RPC exceptions here in a minute, once this catches up, um, we should start seeing those additional exception types. So that's a really handy way to like, start getting more information and get it right, right off the bat. Like you can define your own exceptions. So like, if you have very common things that happen in your Azure functions and when you're processing millions of them a day, it's really nice to just break it out to be like, oh, this is a really common thing that happens. I define my own exception that describes it. And you can see how many people are doing that, what their requests were, where they came from. You know, if you go into these individual exceptions, you can get an end-to-end -end transaction detail and see everything about it, the prop name, where it came from, you know, the address, the host instance ID, if you're tracking that, you can track it by individual people who are coming in, you know, all that stuff. So really powerful stuff here to really get a full, you know, all that stuff that like is like the realm of like .NET developers and stuff, have, you can get it with PowerShell. Like if, if you write it as an Azure function, you have all this telemetry that no matter where, you can build this into a local script, not just Azure functions, if you use that Application Insight client that's built in. So you can get all this telemetry about where your scripts are running and it's built right into PowerShell and get an idea of like how people are using it, where they're using it. All the same data that you saw up there on the PowerShell screen this morning at the keynote, like you can do that yourself. And it's built into PowerShell with that little Application Insights client. All right, uh, da -da. I don't have time to hit durable or attributes. I'll hit one real quick thing about that. So one, one little kind of pet project that I'm working on here is if you look at, um, one thing I was gonna show here is with the create user, um, you can actually bind functions to modules. I don't know if you knew this or not, but if you don't like these, this run.ps1 crap, you can actually define a module and put all your functions in it. In this case, this is my helper function. I need to hide that. Um, I'm so bad with this being so huge. Uh, but uh, so here I have this function create user defined in here. And so when this function runs as part of the durable, um, uh, where'd it go? Create user. So it actually runs it from there. So you can actually, it's like I could delete this run PS1 and keep all my code in a PowerShell module how, how I like it. Um, the big caveat to this is the way that it parses it, all of it has to be in one PSM1. You can't like dot source to other files. So if you're gonna do it this way and you wanna break stuff out, you have to have some method to compile it before you ship it up or else it's not gonna work. Uh, and then one other thing in there, where did he go? Uh, I think it was the durable, where did you go? Oh, never mind, it was on, so that HTTP trigger sample that I showed earlier for the push output binding demo, one thing you may have noticed is these things, which you probably might not have seen before, is these little attributes. So it turns out that in the latest .NET isolated worker, they decided, you know, the, the .NET worker now runs in like the same way that the PowerShell one does. So what's really nice is all these things that I've been complaining about that before like .NET like people didn't care about because it ran inside the, the uh, host itself. Now that they have an isolated worker, they're facing all the problems that the PowerShell worker has. And so all this stuff that I've wanted to be fixed is now suddenly getting fixed because there's this huge .NET audience that like wants the same stuff fixed. And so one of which is that they made these abstractions of these attributes. Typically when you do, um, when you do like C-sharp functions, you don't have a function JSON. You just define your functions with these attributes and that function JSON just sort of gets auto-generated for you. Well, I went in and looked at it. Now that they have an abstraction, attributes are attributes. Like .NET attributes you can use in PowerShell. So these are actually the attributes from that worker that you can actually define with your function and have tags on them. And so you can go in and parse the function after you make it and pull out that metadata and then automatically generate the function JSON. So I have a little build script that I don't write my function JSONs anymore. I just attach these little attributes to my Azure functions and then I hit you know, compile and then it, it just, it builds the function JSON for me to put it out there. There's a couple of tweaks with it and tunes with it, but that's something that I think is really neat. I hope I get the, um, the, uh, the, the worker team to fix some things so that I can publish this module. I just think this is a much more elegant way of doing it. It's like if everything's just in a PowerShell module, just how you're used to developing it locally, you know, that's a great way to do it. So I got one minute left. I wanna show a real PowerShell function here real quick. Just to give you an idea, that's how you can do everything. Here's an example of what it looks like, you know, when it's real. So if we go to, where's my executions? Can I switch this to? I use this one, it's so tiny. Where'd you go? Oh, hey, that's right, I gotta dive in here. I wasn't in App Insights, okay. So here's a, this is a real function that I made three years ago. Um, this was to solve a problem of integrating two ticketing systems. So this basically takes tickets from one system, reads the format, 
you know, reads the JSON, converts some PowerShell objects, reformats it so it'll match the ticketing system of the other ticketing system, and then bring it into that other ticketing system. It's just the glue that ties them together. They want us to pay like, you know, like, like, you know, like 200 grand, you know, with integration costs and such to make this work. I'm like, screw you, I'm gonna do my own with blackjack and hookers, so. So what I did is this function goes through, and if you see here, you know, look at these counts. I'm gonna cut across here and break some rules. If you see here, this function every month runs 6.24 million times. Its average response time is, is half a second in terms of, and that, that's to process the whole function. It initially just accepts it and responds it immediately, and then it drops to a queue, works it in the background. Um, it scales up to multiple instances. Right now it's probably handling eight instances right now, but you know, during the day, at night, it just shrinks back down. I didn't write any of that code, none of that exists. All I did was write the functions and their inputs and outputs, and Azure handles all the scaling for me. You know, I have four million errors there, but that's an example of just like, those are just input-output errors. Those aren't like the, the program doesn't work, it's, a, it's preventing garbage in, garbage out kind of a situation. And so, you know, and then they, that, those people get a report every week, hey, here's all the tickets you, that were automatically submitted that aren't in the right format. There's something wrong with your guys' side of it. This whole thing costs $8 to run a month. It's globally replicated, it runs across 26 different regions, and it has had 100% uptime since I wrote it three years ago. And by the way, I haven't changed a single line of code in three years. I haven't had to update it, because it's just the code. It's, when we say serverless, we don't mean there's no servers, we mean we don't have to care about the servers. I don't have to patch anything, I don't have to upgrade anything, it keeps running. If, if something in Microsoft's data center dies, I don't have to care about it, they just fail it over to another instance, the cold start happens within 20 seconds or so, and that's the power of Azure Functions. So thank you very much.